everybody. Welcome to our webinar. We got, I'm Nancy Tegeter and Jillian Sidoti here with crowdfundinglawyers.net. We'll be hosting today. Um, and we are super excited and super grateful to have, oh, hi Jillian. She's connecting there. Welcome. We have some special guests today. The, their company is Keystone CPA. We got Amanda Hahn, Matt McFarland, Hi guys, welcome. Oh, oh there's my camera. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> we're all we're all remote. We're all in our separate homes, um, doing this live. I think you know we've been in this a, a long enough now. This is becoming the norm to do our webinars from our homes. We we hope our animals and our kids will will keep quiet during this. Yes. Um, but we thanks everyone for coming. And uh, we'll hang on just a minute before we get started to let the room fill up. Oh, all right. Jillian's having some audio technical difficulties, so we'll let her figure that out. But uh, yeah. She's typing. We'll see what she has to say. <laughs> all right. Yeah. How about before we actually jump into your presentation, do you guys mind just giving us a little bit of background of who you are and your experience? So all of those who are listening in can have an idea of who you are. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, well, first off, thanks for having us. It's uh, exciting to be here. These are uh, definitely uh, new and changing times uh, for everyone, uh, as well as, you know, tax in the tax world. So excited to be talking about those things. Uh, Matt and I, uh, we have a firm called Keystone CPA, and we specialize in uh, proactive tax planning strategies for real estate investors. So uh, most of our clients uh, are real estate investors, but they range from, you know, just the, uh, you know, landlords to uh, syndicators, to wholesalers and fix and flippers. So um, I know today on the call, we have mostly syndicator clients. Um, so we'll touch on and kind of highlight things that might be more relevant to syndicators, um, but also going on just general um, tax benefits for real estate investors as a, a result of uh, the latest uh, coronavirus tax relief. So you can pass that on to your investors uh, or you know, maybe just other colleagues and other investor friends of yours. Okay. And we're, and we're uh, for those people who don't know, we are a husband and wife team, so we're not violating the stay-at-home orders in any way whatsoever. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we both have experience working. We started a big four accounting firm 20-plus years ago and kind of got our feet wet in the tax world and with real estate and private client advisors, high net worth individuals. And so we started our own firm, I guess, 12 years ago now. And so, yeah, probably 80, 90% of our clients are in, in real estate to, to some, some way. So, um it's kind of what we like and what we know, and we're excited to kind of be here and hopefully help people understand the magnitude of the changes that have come out in the last month. I mean, it's probably the most amount of changes in the tax law in the shortest period of time that I've seen in 20 years, obviously. So, For sure. And there's a lot of questions. We've had great response to this webinar topic. So I know a lot of people are really interested in understanding what's going on. Um, I just want to say about you guys, I reach out to Keystone often. Um, I'm not a tax attorney. Um, so I, and obviously there's a lot of tax questions that come up in real estate. And so they've been very helpful. They're very responsive to my questions. They're, they're very good at making the language in the tax code understandable um, for everyone. So I'm really looking forward to this. I have a few housekeeping items. Um, if you do have questions during the course of this webinar, I want you to put them in the Q&A section. So not in the chat, but over in the Q&A. And then at the end, once we've gone through, we'll try and answer the, as many live questions as possible. So if something comes up during the course of this, put that there. Also at the end, I believe we're going to have um, a survey just real quick. We'd love to always get feedback on what we've done great and what we can do to improve. So we'd appreciate if you guys would stick around at the end of that and help fill that out. Um, and with that, I think we should probably go ahead and get started. We have a All right. Sounds yeah. good. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, as you can see, for those of you who can see the screen, we have a pretty um, a, a, a pretty significant uh, agenda here <laughs> that we're going to try to cover. Um, so we will take questions, I guess, you know, from you guys, Nancy, and, and the audience. Go ahead and put them in the chat box. So we'll try to answer as many questions as we can as we go along, and then also take questions at the end as well. Uh, so we're going to cover the uh, impact, the economic impact payment that's coming out also known as the stimulus check. Um, 
New tax deadlines and payment extensions. Uh, we're going to go over tax changes for real estate investors, retirement accounts, uh, and then also touch on the PPP program, which is the Paycheck Protection Program, and then the IDLE loan, uh, which I think are on the top of minds for many people. And there's actually some new changes that um, that uh, we just became aware of as late as last night with respect to um, one of these loans that we'll touch on. Oh yeah, and so we should we should give the tip the typical standard disclaimer we've given the last couple of weeks is that. This is all accurate as of this moment in time. So uh, an hour from now, the rules could totally change. So don't hold that, hold that against us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's happened where things change as we were on a webinar before too, so. I'll click on. Oh, do I have to click on site, technically? Okay, so the first thing we wanna talk about is the economic impact payment. So you guys probably, you know, a lot of people have heard about this in the media. This is a $1,200 payment or the $2,400 payment for a married couple that the, uh, the government's gonna be sending out. And it's our understanding the IRS actually has just started sending that out or is gonna be sending it out this week. So um, it's 1,200 for a single person, like I said, 2,400 for a married couple, you get an extra $500 for, for kids that live at home or and or dependents that you're taking care of, I think that live at home. Um, head of household with one child, you're getting some, you know, 1750 in the middle there. There is AGI phase out ranges, so as an example, if a married couple makes more than $198,000, they're not going to get anything from this check. Um, now, they need kind of a couple of things to keep in mind here is that the they are basing these calculations off of uh, the amount of the payments are based on your most recently filed tax return. So either 2019, if you've already filed, or if you haven't, it's going to be based on 2018. But at the end of the day, it's actually going to be <laughs> it's actually going to be based on your 2020 tax year. So if you happen to you know, have a higher income in 2019 or 18, whatever it's based on. And then 2020, you drop below the phase out range and you should have gotten more money. You'll get more money when you file your 2020 tax return. Yeah. And this, I think, impacts a lot of our clients in the real estate space, you know, whether it's real estate brokers or investors or even syndicators. You know, a lot of our syndicator clients had really great years in 2018 and 2019, they had a lot of acquisition fees and things like that. So, um, you know, again, just because you might've had good years in 18 and 19 does not mean you're not eligible for this economic impact payment. You still could be eligible. There's plenty of time to do planning still for the 2020 year, right? You could still do cost segregation. You can maximize your write-offs. And if your 2020 income is below these thresholds, then you will still get that credit when you file the 2020 tax return. Okay. Now, a couple other things too is if you end up, if you get the if you get the the payments based on eighteen or nineteen, but then your two thousand twenty income is higher than the threshold, like the opposite example, you don't actually need to repay whatever they gave you that you you know received that you shouldn't have gotten, I guess. Um, and then the other thing is the IRS now has a, a website. We're getting a lot of questions about this too. What about non-filers, people that don't have to file tax returns, so maybe older parents or your income is below the filing thresholds. The IRS has a website now where you can go in and put your information in, you know, name, social security number, things like that, bank account information. And then they will use that to issue your check, you know, send it to direct deposit. Um, there's also information in there if you want your money direct deposited, but maybe you didn't have a bank account on your last tax return, you can go into the IRS website, fill in your bank account information. And if obviously assuming they haven't sent you your check yet, then they will, they will do the direct deposit for you. All right, let's move on to uh, tax extension. So this one, things were constantly changing uh, in the last couple of weeks, but um, this is the latest information. So all tax returns and payments that were due uh, between April 1st and June 15th are now extended. I'm sorry, <laughs> July 15th are now extended till July 15th. Okay, so this is for all tax returns. Uh, due between this period. Now, um, for the syndicators, I guess one unanswered question still is, you know, for syndications that are in LLC partnerships, they were actually due by March 15th. So does this deadline, um, you know, did the additional time apply to those entities? Um, and I think generally the consensus is no, because those would have already been filed or extended back in March. Um, however, to add further confusion, the IRS did say that partnership returns and flow through entities are, you know, they consider non-corporate entities are part of this extension. 
So, uh, you know, I think depending on, you know, which way you lean, but, but our recommendation for clients is if you had partnership returns as corps and you have not filed extensions, we want to get them done still sooner rather than later, because don't really, it's really unclear whether those returns that were already due by March, um, if they fall within this uh, definition. Okay. So a couple of things to note here is that typically, obviously when we, yeah, someone had a question. Oh yeah, it's Jillian. <laughs> I just real quick, I wanted to remind everybody to please put their questions in the Q and A box. I can see some coming up in the chat and we're all, all going to have a ton of questions because I already have questions. So um, if you guys could please Q and A box so we can organize um, all these. All right, wonderful. Thank you. So a couple of things to note is just, you don't need to file an extension form by April 15th. The, the date was automatically pushed back. So basically tax returns are not due until July 15th. Um, you don't have to make the payments by April 15th. That deadline is also pushed back to July 15th. Uh, now, what if your tax returns are already in progress? Maybe, you know, you've already been working with your CPA. It's close to being done. Obviously, if you're looking at getting a refund, uh, the, the idea would be to, you know, and, and it's close to being done, go ahead and get it done so you can get your money as soon as possible. Uh, now, if you do happen to get your tax return done between now and July 15th and you owe money, you can still file your return in April and not have to pay the, make the payment until July 15th. So that's a nice, that's a nice thing. Um, and you. Oh yeah. Sorry. Let me move this down. I was just looking at all the questions coming in. We'll try to answer them. Yeah. And, uh, if you're not going to, the other thing is if you're not going to have it done by July 15th, that would be the point in time when you're going to need to file an extension and then still make your best estimate of what you would owe for the 2019 year to, to pay by July 15th. Um, now these, that's all the federal stuff. A couple other things to kind of keep in, keep in mind is second, first and second quarter estimated taxes due for 2020 are now pushed back to July 15th. Uh, the state of California has also gotten on board with a lot of this too. So basically everything that was due, April 15th for the state or anywhere between April and July is now pushed back to July. So that includes 2019 returns. That includes the LLC and corporate minimum tax payments that were due April 15th. That includes LLC gross receipts fee that might be due June 15th typically. So a lot of that, that's good that California is kind of on board helping with this. Uh, another thing that's come up, IRA contributions for the 2019 year. A lot of people know that you can still make, typically you can make contributions up until April 15th for the previous year to your traditional and Roth IRAs and also your health savings accounts. That deadline's been also pushed back to July 15th. So that gives you a little more time to, you know, come up with the money if you need to. Yeah. And this, so, um, you know, for a lot of investors and also syndicators, you know, operating in multiple states. So states all have their own deadlines. Um, so definitely check with your tax advisor to see what each state's specific deadline is. The good news though, is I looked on AICPA, um, uh, website yesterday morning, and it looks like the vast majority of states uh, are following the IRS and um, providing additional deadlines. Uh, mostly, they're applying them through July. There are a few that have only extended through June. So, um, you know, definitely something to check out. And again, the AICPA, if you just Google AICPA state deadline coronavirus, there's a chart that they're updating daily on, you know, where states are with respect to extending. So I'll take a couple of questions uh, from the queue. Uh, Tracy says, uh, if, what if you've made a tax payment in 18 but haven't filed 18 yet? Will you get the stimulus check? Um, so no, they still need a tax return for 18 or 19. Um, so I would recommend getting that filed sooner rather than later. Another question is, what if uh, for the economic payment, what if I have a... Um, a new child, right, uh, for that $500. So if you had a child in 2019, that will be reflected when you file the 19 return if you haven't already done so. If you had a child in 2020, again, all of this credit could be trued up on the 2020 return. So with what, by the time you file 2020 return with the new baby and your income is lower, then you will get that additional um, credit on the actual tax return, okay? Uh, one person asked, uh, you know, if I've uh, been 
paying the IRS via EFT payment? Is that the account that they will send my refund to? That's a great question, Raj. I've not really seen that either way, but the IRS has indicated um, that they're rolling out a new page on their website as of any day. Uh, there's actually a placeholder now, if you go on the IRS website, where you can go in and put your banking information. Okay, so for people that didn't have direct deposit refund or, um, you know, got checks refunded before, you can now put in your banking information to get that money a little bit sooner, right? So I know we have more questions. Please share a link. Yeah, so I think uh, Nancy and Jillian will send, will try to send you links for the AICPA and various things that we're talking about. So we can share that after the webcast, okay? All right, let's move on. I know we have a lot of questions in the queue. Uh, we'll try to take as many as we can. So we talked about all that. All right, 1031 exchange and Ozone, this is a big one. So this, and this just came out like, no joke, like two days ago. Um, as part of all these extensions, you know, a lot of questions were circulating in the industry about, well, what about 1031 exchanges, opportunity zone investments? Because those come with their own time sensitive deadlines, right? You know, if, if people are familiar with the 1031 exchange, you've got the 45 day identification period, you, which is part of the overall 180 day replacement purchase period. Um, so notice 2020-23 just came out a couple days ago. Now it doesn't specifically mention 1031 exchanges or ozone investments, but the consensus that we're hearing from industry colleagues and people we respect greatly, um, the notice does talk about the language it uses as time sensitive actions. And so the, the consensus is that in that notice is that an affected taxpayer, somebody that has a 1031 exchange with one of these deadlines that was falling between April 1st and July 15th is gonna be covered by, covered by the extension. So an example is if your 45 day identification period was ending, let's say April 30th, well now that has been pushed back to July 15th, gives you a little bit more time to complete that, what they're calling time sensitive action. Or if your 180 day period was gonna end, you know, June 15th, that can be pushed back to July 15th now. Um, the one thing that, you know, is not known as far as what we've seen is that let's say your 45 day window is, was supposed to fall in that period of time, it's pushed back to July 15th. Uh, does that automatically mean your 180 day period that was gonna close you know, sometime after that is also pushed back? Uh, as of now, my understanding is the answer is no on that. So it's just pushing back whatever deadline happened to fall between April 1st and July 15th with no extension on the set, on the, on the back end if, if you're in that situation. Uh, and then I think the same thing with what happened with, you know, apply to opportunity zones. So if you, in that 180 day window trying to reinvest your capital gains, that 180 day deadline should be pushed back to July 15th, so. Yeah, and you know, you've probably seen, you've probably received a lot of emails from 1031 exchange intermediaries talking about the new deadline and how you can have more time to close on it. Uh, so far, I've not received any, um, you know, specific guidance on opportunity zones at all. But again, you know, if we uh, go under this, um, the reading of the law that says time sensitive transactions get this deferral, then, you know, obviously the, the date to reinvest in opportunity zone is very similar to the 1031 exchange. Um, and hopefully we'll get this benefit of, you know, additional time to reinvest as well. I know it's, you know, difficult for investors right now to pull the trigger, you know, on, on investing larger sums of money into real estate. So that's, you know, uh, hopefully a little bit of help for, for investors in the interim. So another change that came out under the CARES Act had to do with net operating losses. So net operating losses in short is just if you have an overall loss on your, you know, we'll keep it simple on your individual tax return. Um, prior to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, you used to be able to either carry that loss backwards up to five years or two years, depending on what, what year this was in place. And then, or, and, or you could carry it forward if it wasn't used or you decided that it would be more beneficial to carry the loss forward. Well, that under the CARES Act now, they now are allowing people to carry back their NOLs again. So either if you have an NOL in 2018, 2019, or if you end up one with on your 2020 return, um, you and your CPA, your team of advisors can go through the you know analysis and say, well, if we carry it back, you have to carry it back five years. So as an example, maybe you're a real estate investor, you know, syndicator in 18, but then you have a large portfolio of rental properties to the cost say, got extra depreciation, you create an overall loss. If you wanted to carry that back, you carry that back to your 2013 return, you apply the loss against your income from 13 and get a refund of taxes you overpaid in 13. That's, you know, in essence how that works. But you and your advisor should still look at it and say, well, does it make 
more sense to carry it back or does it make more sense to carry it forward? And that's going to kind of come down to what tax bracket you're in each year, how much taxes you pay, what type of income, that, those kind of things. So it's not a, it's not a one size fits all, obviously. Yeah. And another, you know, on the same set of changes, they, you know, at, under the tax cuts and jobs act, they started limiting the usage of net operating losses. So, so under that law, you can only reduce up to 80% of taxable income. So that was also taken away uh, under the CARES Act. So essentially, if you're doing a carry back, like Matt was talking about, you could potentially offset 100% of taxable income in the previous years. Um, so I think, you know, this impacts, you know, a handful of our clients, uh, specifically in the syndication space, it, you know, again, for apartment owners, especially lots of COSEG, lots of, you know, big write offs that, you know, under the old rule, you, you don't really get to use it, you have to wait into the future to offset future income. So this is a great opportunity to be able to go back and claim the refund immediately. And in fact, if you do so, I think what it, was it before June 30th? Or yeah, so if you're, let's say you filed 2018, you had a loss. Um, typically there's a, there's a quick refund form, which is a form 1045. You generally have to file that within 12 months of the end of the year that had the loss. So as an example, if you're talking about 2018, you had a loss, you have to file this form 1045 by December 31st of 2019. The benefit of the 1045 is that the IRS has to process these and issue the refunds within, I think it's like 45 to 60 days versus if you go through the typical amending process, we got to file an amendment return. That can that gives them anywhere from three to six months to actually issue your refund. So the thing that came out recently was that that form ten and forty five for the two thousand eighteen year, they're extending the deadline of that instead of December thirty first nineteen. They're extending that to June thirtieth of two thousand twenty. So basically, right now you've got you know another month and a half. If you find yourself in that situation, if you decide that hey, carrying back my eighteen NOL is going to be beneficial to me then look at filing that form 1045 by June 30th. All right. Another big change in the investor space is a qualified improvement property. So under the CARES Act, basically qualified improvement property, uh, in, instead of depreciating it uh, over 39 years, uh, you can now take bonus depreciation and write it off immediately in the year that you made the improvement. And this also is retroactive to 2018. Okay, so this is for the investors on the call. This is for those of you who have non residential real estate. So essentially commercial real estate. Um, if you're making uh, qualified improvement properties, you would have in the past when you file the return for 18, or if you already filed for 19, um, odds are they would have been depreciated over 39 years. So now what you can do is file amended returns to take bonus depreciation, write off 100% of those improvements immediately. And again, going back to the previous slide, right? So we create a bigger loss, a bigger write off. Now, not only can you have that loss, but you can also carry it back to previous years and claim a refund. Um, so, you know, you can see the, essentially the, the, the goal of the company is to, I mean, the company, the goal of the IRS is to try to get money in your pocket sooner rather than later through these various, you know, refund claim opportunities. So, I mean, think of, think about that numbers wise, right? Like, let's say you do $200,000 of, of these qualified improvements. I mean, under the old rule that over 39 years, that's like five grand a year that you would take a deduction of. Um, but under the new rule, you take an immediate deduction of $200,000 right away. I mean, that's, that's a that can, huge change. I mean, that's huge change for your investors. Uh, it's a huge potential change in your refunds. Now, a couple of things that it does that is not included on this, it excludes uh, building enlargements, um, elevators or escalators, or anything that's like internal structural framework of a building. Um, so, but anything besides that, it's kind of been a qualified improvement that used to be 39 years. You should be able to get it over 15 years with the immediate bonus depreciation. And we have a question on the slide from Azim. I don't know if I pronounced it right. So would Airbnb residential unit come under this qualified improvement? Unfortunately, the answer is no, because Airbnb is residential and this is for commercial real estate. So commercial, uh, you know, examples of commercial uh, medical buildings, office buildings, CVS, uh, this is generally what that new benefit applies for. Okay. All right. So let's move on to uh, another uh, great new change for uh, all taxpayers, but you know, very beneficial for real estate investors is the business loss uh, limitations. Yeah. So this, this came out 
at the end of 2017, it was, uh, it's been referred to as like the excess business loss limitation. Essentially, the government put a cap on the uh, 250,000 for single people or 500 for a married couple as to the total amount of net overall losses you could claim in a single tax year from active businesses. So K1s that you are actively involved in, or if you're a real estate professional taking rental losses, you combine all those things, the, the most the loss you could take in one year was 500 for a married couple, for example. So it's the, what, what changed now is the CARES Act did away with that limitation for the 2018, 19, and 20 years. So that just means that if you happen to have, you know, again, the example of a real estate professional with rental properties doing cost segregation, if they had, I don't you know, a million dollars of a net overall loss from the rental properties, well, now they can deduct that million dollars instead of limiting the $500,000. So that can obviously have a you know, su substantial impact and change in your tax situation. Yeah, and this is another com I mean, this is one that we're looking at currently for a handful of clients, you know, again, in a syndicator space. In the past, we have people who, you know, maybe in 2018 made a lot of acquisition fee. And then they have all these losses from their rentals and the syndications, but back, you know, in, under the old rules, we can only offset part of it because of this limit. And so now that limitation is gone. Um, so there's an opportunity to go back and, and claim refunds for some of these things. Uh, let me see if there's any questions relating to this. So someone said, if you have a loss in 2016, can you carry it back? Yeah. So the specifically this NOL change relates to 2018, 19 and 20 years. Uh, back in 2016, uh, you know, this is four years ago. I don't remember the exact rules at that point in time as whether they, what the carryback period was. Um, in my head, I feel like it was two years. But the other thing to keep in mind is that generally you need to, on a typical annual carryback, so let's say 2016 return, you would have filed sometime in 2017. Generally, you have three years from the date you file the return to file the amended return to do the annual carryback. So what that would imply would be is if you filed your return on time in 2017 by April, that you're basically, you know, your statute of limitations is expired. Now, if you didn't file until October, you may still have some time to do that. But it, unfortunately, I don't, like I said, I don't remember what the carryback period, I think it was two years, but it, it could have been five at that point for all, for all I remember. Uh, another question on the, uh, the previous slide, where we talked about qualified improvement property for bonus depreciation. One of the questions um, from Mark is, can you define residential versus commercial? How many apartments qualify as commercial? Uh, so unfortunately, apartments do not qualify as commercial real estate. I know it does for loan purposes, for, but for tax return purposes, apartments are always residential real estate. Um, so there wouldn't be any qualified improvement properties for apartment buildings. Uh, again, those, you know, mainly you're talking about office buildings, um, you know, warehouse, medical buildings, things like that. Now, I, you know, I know that real estate investors are very, very creative. So uh, one thought to come to my mind, you know, mixed use property. So you've got some retail on the bottom, apartments on top. Um, if you do improvements to the retail part of the property, that can qualify as qualified improvement property. But you have to, you'd have to be able to segregate those and show that they were specifically related to the quote unquote commercial part. All right, let me see if there's any other questions. Qualify improvement, can it be a commercial lease as a tenant? I, I think the answer, so the question is for the qualified improvements, can you, can this uh, apply to a tenant making their own improvements to a property? Um, I think the answer is yes, um, but I, let, me, let me double check that. I can shoot the answer to, to Nancy and Jillian later and they can, they can shoot it out to everybody. Okay. This for Voltaire. Yeah, I believe it's yes too, but we'll double check on that to confirm. Okay. All right. So uh, retirement accounts, a lot of changes you've probably seen with respect to retirement accounts. Um, so these are things that could, you know, apply to you as an investor, as a syndicator, uh, but also, you know, maybe something just to let your investors know, right? Because I, I know in terms of our clients, we have a lot of people always wanting to take money out of retirement account, put it into real estate. So um, one quick note, okay, we're not saying that it's a good idea to take money out of retirement account. It's just that if you need to, or if you would like to, there is an opportunity to do so under the new CARES Act. So uh, essentially, there's, there's two different um, opportunities. We'll go over the first one, which is coronavirus related retirement account distributions. Okay, the, this is just taking money out of the retirement account altogether. Um, so you can now take up to $100,000 between now and the end of the year. 
uh, the, mo the money can be withdrawn from IRAs as well as 401ks. Uh, and also this applies to self-directed IRAs, self-directed 401ks. Um, and the benefit is you take this money out today, it's free from any early distribution penalties. Okay, so you don't have to worry about the 10% early distribution penalty from the government. Uh, and also uh, the other benefit is that the distribution is still taxable, but instead of paying taxes on all of that money immediately, you can choose to delay the tax over a three year period. Okay, so two benefits, no distribution penalties and the ability to defer the tax over a three year period. Now, if you take the money out and you decided later on, actually, I don't want to pay the tax after all, uh, you have the opportunity to put that money back into retirement account to avoid the taxes on those funds. So very flexible. We have clients that are looking at, what if I take my money out and invest in real estate in the interim? And then, you know, before the end of three years, I'll just put that back into the, the retirement account. Uh, so yeah, that's a potentially good strategy, um, you know, provided that you're, you're careful in how you're using the fund and there's still money at the end of the day to put that back into the retirement account. <laughs> So also, so we were talking about distributions. The other part of this is uh, 401k loans. So any coronavirus related 401k loans can be taken up to $100,000 by September 23rd. Now the change, the maximum 401k loan used to be up to $50,000 and 50% of your account balance. It's now you can take up to 100% of the account balance, but the limit is now 100,000 instead of 50 grand. So they, they've kind of bumped it up there to give people access to taking, the, taking these loans. Um, now, if you do take a loan, the repayments, you're not required to make any repayments between March 27th and December 31st for these 401k loans. So that's good. Um, now we've been talking about coronavirus related distributions and loans. So the question that comes up obviously is who's eligible for these penalty free distributions or these, you know, the changes in being able to take a 401k loan. So what coronavirus related means is that, you know, either you or your spouse or one of your dependents is diagnosed with the virus or has had adverse financial impacts because of it. Maybe, you, you know, you've reduced your workload to take care of your kids or you've lost your job or you can't work or, you, you know, things like that. Or you're quarantined, all that stuff. Uh, and it, it's a self-certification process. So obviously, you know, you got to be cognizant of that and, you know, make sure it's, you find yourself in that situation. Um, and again, it's it just kind of, giving you the ability to access money that maybe you weren't going to be able to access before without paying penalties or taxes and things. So the, the government's trying to help you a little bit here. So. All right. Let me um, take some questions on here. We have quite a few on the 401k. So what if you already have a 401k loan from last year that you're paying on right now? Uh, so you could still, I mean, so the, under the new rule, you can take, so in the, under the old rule, the maximum loan was $50,000 per taxpayer. So under the new loan, it's a hundred thousand per taxpayer. So if you've already taken out 50, you can take out the remainder, uh, if you're eligible under, you know, the coronavirus related, uh, definition. Another question we had was, you know, what could the money be used for? Are there any restrictions? Currently it doesn't look like there's any restrictions. So it doesn't mean if I take out 50,000, I have to use it on coronavirus medical expenses or anything like that. Okay. So as of today, we've not seen any restrictions, not to say that something like that won't come out later on. Okay. Uh, oh, I think I might've skipped over uh, any restrictions. Okay. If paid some each year, is it paid each year? Can you wait until year three to pay the taxes from Lynn? Uh, good question. I believe you would pay it equally over three years uh, and not necessarily wait until year three to pay the tax. Uh, hasn't really been clarified by the IRS either way just yet. But, but yeah, that, it begs the question though, because it's a good point is one of the exemptions there is to, you know, you can repay the put the distribution back in within three years to not have to pay the tax. And so that's where we're looking for some clarification. Like what if, you know, obviously if you spread the tax over three years, you paid some of the tax, but then you put the distribution back, it would, it would imply that you're going to get a refund under taxes in the end of year three. But again, it's kind of all brand new and they haven't clarified that unfortunately. So. So we have a question. If I took out return money on January 30th, can I qualify for free of charge? I don't know if they mean um, early penalty distribution free. penalties. Yeah. So the question is, if, if the, somebody took the money out on January 30th, can they, does that qualify under the um, penalty free under the coronavirus related? Um, I don't, I don't think so. 
because a lot of the dates that have been thrown out in some of these things for God knows what reason is like February 15th, but it, it could be even later than that. But, um, you know, another question, I don't, is that, do you have it on here? The RMD? No. no we're oh, okay. Oh, so, yeah, we are talking about RMD. Sorry, we are. So one of the other things that came up is um, people that have to take re required minimum distributions, RMDs in their retirement accounts. Um, that has been postponed for the year 2020. So one of the things they did say about that is that if you took, if anybody took an RMD after January 1st, that can be undone and rolled back into your account um, if it's done within 60 days to avoid the tax. So going to the question on the, the Q&A section here, if, you're, if your distribution on January 30 happened to be part of an RMD, um, then maybe you, know, you would have 60 days, but I guess 60 days would have been April 1st. So that I guess wouldn't qualify. Yeah. Um, so, but, but then in that scenario, you could put it back if you can show you are, you know, a coronavirus related, if this is a coronavirus related but it's transaction. But the date, I think that's the, the question of the January 30th thing, so. Yeah. So we'll get back to you on that thing. Cause um, I know there was a date about the R&D stuff. So we'll have uh, Nancy or Jillian send you back. We'll make a note of that question. Yeah, interesting on the RMDs, it's, um, you know, the, you can do typically with our, the 60 day period has to do with doing a one rollover per tax year, which is a standard rule that they put in place a couple of years ago. So I wouldn't be shocked if they kind of lax that rule a little bit for the RMDs related to coronavirus, where you, you know, just let you roll it back in without the 60 day requirement or, or, you know, multiple rollovers. But as of now, that hasn't come out in play. So right now you've got 60 days to undo an RMD and you can do one per year, one 60 day rollover per year. Yeah. So from Nick, you have uh, took out 50,000 last year. So that same as the question previously is so if you took out 50 last year, you could take out the remainder this year, provided it's a coronavirus related distribution. Um, surely if the tax is delayed, does the IRS charge interest? Uh, no, that's our understanding is there's no interest or penalties on that. That's part of the benefit is you can delay the tax. Um, Larry says, can I take out 100,000 from my profit plan? I'm assuming this is some kind of profit sharing 401k plan. Uh, and the answer is yes, as long as coronavirus related. Okay, so in the 401k, you can do a distribution or a loan, uh, up to you. The loan is only available for 401ks, not available for IRAs. Okay. Uh, what else? So John has a question. It says, 401k, so I've been, I've been furloughed, and if I happen to take a loan now and they later lay me off, do I have this, the typical requirement to repay that loan immediately and has that requirement to repay changed yeah so no so you have on the 401k loan this is part of the why they put this together is that you have three years to pay back that loan okay uh what effect does turning 59 january have if you take out a hundred thousand uh no effect okay. anymore because it, um 59 and a half is just the early is the age cutoff for taking early distribution penalty or taking distributions from your retirement accounts that are free from the early distribution penalty. So if you happen to have turned 59 and a half, then you wouldn't have the early distribution penalty generally anyway. Um, but it's a little more flexibility now that you can take the hundred thousand, you know, coronavirus related and, and be free from the from the uh, early distribution penalty. Yeah, and the uh, question from Paul. So yes, the retirement distribution definition does include traditional SEPs, uh, self-directed, all types of retirement accounts. Uh, and again, the distribution is available for IRAs and 401ks. The loan is only available for 401ks. So you, you still cannot take a loan out from uh, an IRA, okay? All right, so I know we have a lot of questions, but let's, um, let's make sure we hop over to uh, the, the different loan programs. So I know we'll have questions on that. And then towards the end, we'll circle back and, and try to close in on any of these other questions we didn't get to answer so far. Uh, so you know, I think uh, one of the hottest discussed topics right now with respect to the tax change uh, has actually been the two loan programs under SBA, right? The PPP, which is the Paytech Pro Paycheck Protection Program, and also the IDLE loan, which is also known as the Disaster Loan. Um, so we'll just talk about kind of generalities uh, in terms of the plan itself as it relates to real estate investors. Okay, so first, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, generally, this is going to be a better fit for those who are involved 
actively in real estate or what we consider to have active income. And by that, we don't mean being a real estate professional. We mean having income from activities such as fix and flips, wholesalers, syndicators, property managers, uh, maybe even like real estate brokers and things like that. Um, because the loan amount is going to be based on that type of income, whether it's self-employed income or from payroll taxes that you pay yourself. Um, so part or all of this may be forgivable by the government if you are using it for the intended purposes. And we have listed down the intended purposes, usually going to be for payroll, paying for interest, utilities, and other operational expenses. Um, one of the requirements is that if you get this loan, even though you can spend it on all these operational things, in order for it to be forgiven, at least 75% of that would have to be used on payroll related activities. So how does that impact, you know, real estate investors who maybe don't have, you know, 50 employees? The good news is that the Paytech Protection Program does count payroll that you pay to yourself as a owner of a business. So we have a lot of syndicators that run their business maybe as, you know, through an S corporation where they're in acquisition fees and they pay themselves payroll. Even if you're the only employee in that company, you can be eligible for the PPP. Uh, essentially the way it works is that, you know, your S corp will pay you and maybe your employees, if you have any, uh, you'll pay the employees and then the government will give you this loan to pay for those and then forgive part of that loan because it was paid uh, to payroll for payroll expenses, right? So basically government giving you money to pay yourself and to pay for your employees. Um, one of the questions we're getting is where do I apply for this loan? Uh, what well, we tell, you know, what we're seeing is the best place to start with your local bank uh, where you have a business banking relationship with. The reason being that, as you can imagine, banks are inundated with applications. Most of the ones we've seen are saying we are taking, uh, we're working on a, you know, priority based with existing clients. Okay. Not to say they won't take new clients, but many of them are uh, working with existing clients first. Uh, so that's a good place to start. Now, if you, if you um, don't know, you know, go to your bank's website, obviously a lot of them have information, you know, on their landing page now about it. But so if your bank doesn't happen to qualify as an SBA lender, so like we bank with Citibank, um, they just got approved or changed their website like two days ago. So a week before that, they were not set up to do this. So if your bank is like that, where they're not set up to do it, you can go to the SBA website through the PPP links there's a, um, there's a, you can click on find an SBA lender there. You put in your zip code and it'll give you a map of, and a location of, of SBA lenders, you know, approved ones in your area. So you can kind of, you know, go to their websites and, and kind of go from there if you need to. Um, but essentially the government's going to give you money to the incentive of the pro the idea of the program is the government to incentivize you to keep your employees or keep your business going and, and give you money to pay for your employees or, you know, pay for your, 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 income that you might be losing theoretically if you're self-employed. Yeah. Um, and a question from, um, Ann when this one, uh, so yes, payroll, <clears throat> excuse me, payroll expenses do include employer contributions, which is shocking. It's basically the government saying, I'll give you money so you can fund your retirement account. Right. So definitely something really good to take advantage of. Now the downside to this, we said, this is for people with self-employed income, that's income you're either paying payroll taxes on or self-employment taxes on. Um, you don't have to have a legal entity for this. <clears throat> so if you're earning acquisition fee in your individual name, you could still be eligible for this. Now, uh, the downside though is you do have to have some sort of active income. So for landlords, that if all you have is rental income, okay, generally you're not going to be eligible to apply for the PPP because it's based on their definition of payroll and rental income is, does not fall within that definition of payroll. We're really hoping that something will change because this is a huge detriment to you know, most of our landlord investors. So we're just gonna see, you know, hopefully they'll come on and clarify you know, how that's gonna work. One of the questions I, I saw glancing through here is how are they gonna treat um, you know, K-1 income or guaranteed payments income? That's an unknown, the IRS has been silent on that, but you know, I mean, I think 
you can take the position that guaranteed income you pay self-employment taxes on, right? So therefore, potentially use that money to apply for the PPP program. I think worst case, worst case scenario, you apply and then you're denied the loan. So, I mean, you lost some time in filling out the application, but not the end of the world because there's no cost to applying for it anyway. So now this is the next one we'll talk about is the idle loan, the disaster loan. And this one uh, is available for active investors as well. Okay, syndicators, flippers, all those with payroll and self-employed income can also apply for the idle. There's a lot of misconception out there that you can have only one of the two loans, but no, you can apply for both loans. You just can't double dip on the usage of those funds. Um, but for landlords who don't have payroll, the idle loan is kind of the next best thing, okay? Uh, in that essentially similar concept is to provide you with temporary loss of revenue. That's a 30 year loan with 3.75 interest. Um, up to 10% of this or 10,000 of this may be grant free. And I saw a lot of questions about this already, so we'll touch on that. Uh, but when you get this money, it's supposed to be used for payroll interest and other operational expenses. So you can get up to a $2 million loan, okay? Um, now, of that $2 million, the first 10000 might be free money. That's why they call it a grant. And this is the part that's, tripping, that's being tripped up for real estate investors. So previously, um, the CARES Act came out and said, well, you don't have to have employees to get this benefit which is so true. You don't need employees. So landlords with no employees can apply for this loan. However, the SBA recently updated their position to say that in order to get 10,000 of this to become free money, you do have to have employees. So they put a cap of $1,000 per employee. So essentially you would need 10 employees in order to get 10,000 of this money to be completely free money to you. But outside of that, you know, for landlords, you could still get the loan. You just might not be able to get that free, you know, the free or, rent money. Or you might, it might be limited to $1,000 because if you're sole proprietor landlord, you know, you don't have any employees, well, they might count you for that situation. So maybe you get $1,000 instead of 10. Uh, and then, and again, this just kind of came out, um, within the last couple of days, we actually, you know, we applied for this as our business and just got an email last night clarifying this directly from the SBA in, in response to our application. So um, again, you know, not surprising that the information coming out originally wasn't very clear. Um, but, you know, like you said, we're kind of learning more and more every day. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, again, it's kind of to help you with a temporary loss of revenue. It's, um, you know, theoretically, they're supposed to give you the $10,000 in your, up to $10,000 into your bank account within three days of approving your application. You know, when do they approve your application? Obviously anybody's guess is as good as, um, now the difference with the idle, how you apply for the idle loan is slightly different than the PPP. So the PPP, you go through SBA approved lenders, your local banks, national banks, the idle loan, you actually apply directly from the SBA website. So that's my understanding, right? So yeah. Yeah. So, and the, yeah, that was another question. Someone said they applied with the PPP on the SBA website. Do they need to apply with a lender? Um, I don't think that could have worked. I think with what you submitted on the SBA website was the idle loan. And so if you are eligible for the PPP, you do need to go to a lender for that. Okay. So it's two different points of application for the two different loan types. Um, so Tony, if I have no employees, I understand idle grant is zero. Uh, yes, that's our understanding. And, um, but again, I think you might be able to make the, make the argument that you're your own employee, because it does say on the eligibility for an idle, it does say sole proprietors, independent contractors. So theoretically that would imply that you are at least one person, right? So I think you can make the argument you should be getting, you know, a thousand dollars. Oh, wow. From Tracy. She said, I received my 10,000 advance today. That is awesome. This is, you're the first person I've seen uh, or heard who has received it. So very exciting. All right. So this is, I mean, this is the end of the presentation part. We have so many questions. We'll try to answer as many as we can, but just to sum it all up, what does it mean? Well, lots of opportunities for real estate investors uh, in terms of maximizing losses, going back and claiming refunds, um, you know, even accessing retirement money if you want. Uh, but, you know, the details are ever changing and evolving as we speak. So um, make sure you are keeping in close contact with your tax advisors, with your lenders, with your attorneys, uh, so that you're kind of getting the latest and greatest information. Okay. 
Um, all right, let's go to, I don't know, how do you guys want to do the questions, Nancy and Jillian? I was just <laughs> popping around, but I'll let you guys take it. I'm here. Nancy, how about you uh, take it away? You want to start with some of these uh, questions here? And actually, I have some questions on uh, other platforms that we've been getting. So let me, let me actually ask you those, if you don't mind, real quick. Um, Derek asks, I am an independent owner of multifamily properties in Michigan. I don't normally pay myself for work that I do in the apartments. Can I use PPP money to pay myself for a rehab on two units I'm doing currently? So, um, so PPP does, does count for self-employed people. Um, one of the underlying things, you got to use it for payroll, uh, your rent, interest, utilities, things like that. And you do need to spend that money over a two month, an eight week period after you get approved for the loan. Now, if you haven't paid yourself yet, um, your loan calculation. So we actually, and we, we, I said, we mentioned, we applied for the idle loan. We also applied for the PPP loan. I just finished doing that last week. Um, now we have, you know, eight, 10 employees in our business. So it, it took, you know, gathering information took a few hours, uh, obviously it'd be a simpler process for a self-employed person. But so what I gathered from that is that when you're applying for the PPV, there is a section where, you know, you're clarifying, is this an S corp, a C corp partnership, blah, 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 independent contractor. Um, now for us, they're asking for payroll over the previous 12, the average monthly payroll over the last 12, 12 months. And again, that includes payroll, that includes retirement contributions the employer makes, it includes group health insurance premiums the employer makes for the employees. So as a self-employed person, they're, I'm guessing they're gonna ask you for your, what your net profit was over the previous 12 months, you know, that you're paying self-employment self taxes on. Um, so that's going to be your starting point with determining how much loan you can get, you know, so how you spend that money at that point in time after you get the loan. Yes. Uh, theoretically, if you decide to pay yourself a payroll for the next two months, that could count towards spending that money. And, and you, you know, obviously if you get the loan, you want to make sure you're spending it on the approved things because the part that you don't spend on the approved things, you have to repay. It's not forgiven on the PPP side. So the forgiven part of the loan is the amount you're spending on the qualified expenses. So, yeah, and something to keep in mind, you know, just um, these are loans with the government. And so you don't want to do anything crazy. You know, we have clients who say, hey, you know, I'm a flipper and, um, you know, I pay myself and I'm going to use all this money to rehab my property, uh, you know, basically rebuild something from the ground up and the government's going to pay for it. Um, I don't feel that's the intended purpose, right? <laughs> uh, it should be used for a kind of recurring expenses. Um, you know, a lot of these are very great, right? So you don't really know which way the government is leaning, but I would always try to err on the side of being conservative because you know these are government programs and you don't want to get in trouble with the federal government right but yeah a lot of that is going to be based on previous year and kind of how you filed your tax returns so for those who haven't filed 2019 yet this is a great planning opportunity right um okay so i mean this is great franklin asks do we read the stimulus retirement account rules regarding solo 401ks correctly to say one can take a loan from one solo 401k up to $100,000. And since the solo 401k could be rolled into our Roth, we have three years to return the 401k to the Roth. Spreading out payment, paying the rollover taxes over the three years repayment period provided in the stimulus bill. Me spread out the taxes over three years instead of one. Yeah. So um, the they're they're not mutually exclusive. So you can take a four hundred one k loan, and or a distribution. And if you have more money, you can put that into roll it to an IRA, and the IRA can also take out a distribution as well and delay the tax. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll go ahead and read the next one. Um, All right. From David. So David asks. She's delayed. I'll go ahead. Oh, I thought you were saying you were going to read the next one. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> been quiet. <laughs> your timing's off. So you're, anyway, I'll go with David. All right. With the Stimulus Act, can a real estate professional carry back depreciation to a prior year when they had a gain? So there's two scenarios he gave. First is a loss in 2020, but a gain in 2019. Both years, the individual is a real estate professional. 
Scenario two is a real estate professional in 2019 and 2020, but not in 2018. Can they carry back? Can they also carry back the loss from 2020 to all the way back to 2018? So, so on the good questions, um, but kind of the first thing with the annual carrybacks, yeah, A, with the depreciation, you're, you're not technically carrying back the depreciation. You have to look at, does the depreciation generate an overall loss for you in the year in question? If it does, you're, you know, you're a real estate professional, you can deduct the loss. Uh, with the annual carryback though, the annual has to be carried back. The rule is you have to carry back five years first, apply it against five years ago. And if it's not used up entirely, then you carry. Then you move it to four years ago. Then you move it to three years ago. So you can't cherry pick what years you're carrying it back to. So if you have a loss from 2020 year, and you want to carry it back, you're carrying it back to your 2015 year, not your 2019 year. Now you might get to 2019 if you don't use it up in 15, 16, 17, 18. But that's probably not his his uh, you know goal there. Based on the question I'm hearing. Okay. All right. Um, and then the last one from this platform is from Larry. He says, what relief, if any, is available to CRE owners? For example, shopping center owners. Tenants can get loans to pay employees and hopefully rent, but I see nothing for landlords with mortgages and bills to pay, and there's no assurance tenants will use any relief to pay rent. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so, uh, you know, for commercial real estate owners, again, if you have employees in your investing business, you can apply for the PPP loan. So essentially government will help you pay your employees who are managing the properties. Essentially, if you don't have employees, you can apply for the idle loan. You won't get that 10,000 grant, right? That's the, the bad news that came out from the SBA recently, but you still get to, you know, have that loan, uh, for someone, you know, in that commercial space, space that has a commercial real estate, um, one of the things we talked about earlier was the qualified improvement property, right? So you, if you made improvements from 18, 19, or 20, you can go back and do bonus depreciation and then claim a refund from the government, okay? So those are kind of three major pieces as it respects, you know, as it relates to commercial real estate owner. Okay. So at this point, I'm seeing 73 questions. I don't think we're going to get to all of those today. Um, I don't know if you guys want to pick through a couple more just to finish out our hour. And then maybe later after the fact, we can try and circle back and respond to a few general questions we see. As you, two, you two are very popular. I wish I, I wish I was as popular as you guys. You're like the cool. That's, that's very kind, kind of you to say, but, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll repeat that to myself later today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh it's too funny um so, yeah you guys go ahead and just pick out which ones you think are the most appropriate to sure. answer um and that will probably yeah okay yeah i mean like we just we did a webinar that went on for like two hours uh two weeks ago <laughs> so many questions but i love all the questions because it helps me to know what i don't know all right so from jeff i'll I'm, I'm just randomly scrolling through, but how do you get the idle loan if you don't have employees? You can still get employees. So you don't need to have employees to get the idle loan. Um, but part of that loan, that's the 10,000 grant is what you need employees for. So, okay, just because you don't have employees, you still should apply for the idle loan if you need that loan money. You just won't, you know, it, it would just be a regular loan that you have to repay to the government. Um, it's not going to be something that's forgiven, okay? Uh, as idols, landlords suffering trouble tenants, do you have employees? Yes, you have to have employees on the idle loan. I'm so sorry. That's like the most terrible news I can give well, you guys. You, you, have to have, um, you, you have to have employees to be for the grant part of it, grant. but for the right. actual loan itself. Um, can I ask you a question about that actually, Matt? Yes. You mentioned that if you don't have employees, you don't get the grant part necessarily, but you may have an argument for at least one being self-employed. Mm -hmm. um, I guess first, what would you need maybe to establish that? And second, what about independent contractors? Would that, would there be anything with? Well, yeah. And, that, and that's where it comes from. Because when you look at the, when you look at the eligibility, it clearly says businesses with less than 500 employees or sole proprietorships or independent contractors. Okay. And so that would imply that you are eligible for the loan. Now, I think when you go through the application process for the idle, it asks you how many employees you have. Um, now, so my argument would be as a self-employed person, you are considered, you know, 
theoretically considered an employee. So a sole proprietor, independent contractor, I think would fall into that category. So when you're looking for the grant money, I think it's, it would be safe to put in that you have one employee. They may send you the thousand dollars. They may not. Um, yeah. And then, then, then the rest of it is just them going through and approving you for the overall loan. You know, how much loan are you looking for? That kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So yeah. we have a good question from, um, Warner says, can we find out from Tracy who received the 10,000? Uh, when did you apply? Uh, and I'm also curious, was it for your rental business or was it for, you know, a non-rental business? All right. Uh, can you, uh, can each spouse apply for idle loan if both self-employed? Uh, good question. I believe when you apply, it just kind of depends um, on how you're structured, but I believe when you go through the loan process, it does ask you for who, uh, who the owners of the businesses are. So if you're self-employed and you're filing marriage return, I imagine you're putting both of your information on there combined as one. Um, but you know, the, the loan application itself is super simple. It's only like three real questions. You know, what's your gross revenue, cost of goods sold and expected loss of rent. Um, so, you know, just with that question, right, it's pretty clear the idle loan is intended, uh, to include landlords because they're asking you, how much did you, are you, do you think you will lose on rental income? Right. Um, but yeah, just throwing the wrench in there that they also want employees for the tax-free part of that money too. Let's see if Tracy responded to our questions. No. Can you use the money to hire new employees? Uh, yes, the money can be used to hire new employees from the PPP. Uh, but the caveat is the IRS does require that the business be existing and in operation uh, back to February 15th. Is it February 15th or February 1st? Anyway, 1st or the 15th, back in February of 2020. Okay. So you had to have a business and we get, we're getting this from people too. What if I already laid off my employees? Uh, you can hire them back after you get the money and pay, f uh, and pay them with that money. Okay. So no problem if you, you know, already got rid of employees in the interim. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's have look at grants. Do the grants have to be applied for separately? No, it's all one of the process. So if you apply for the idle loan, there's a, just a box you check that says, yes, I want to be considered for the grant. And that's it. Um, I think there was a question earlier about the, um, on the PPP side. So if, you know, you end up getting the loan and you use it for all the intended purposes, the loan is forgiven. Is that forgiven amount taxable? And our understanding is the answer is no, it's not taxable. So, um, again, you know, government can change their, change your mind on that, but that's as of currently our understanding is that if you, you know, go through all the steps and you get the PPP loan, you follow the rules and the loan is forgiven that it's not included as taxable income. So this is a great question for investors. Do shareholder distributions count as payroll? Uh, so no, currently it does not. So if you're an S corp owner, um, or you're at a partnership and you're getting distributions, that is not part of payroll. Okay. So, um, the income is going to basically be W2 or what you're paying self-employment taxes on. Uh, and because we don't pay self-employment taxes on the distributions, that's why it's not part, it's not fall, does not fall within the definition of payroll. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh my gosh. So many great questions on here. <laughs> I think, I mean, we could spend probably another two hours doing that. I think we wanted to not take too much more of your time. We appreciate you guys have spent over an hour here. Um, this has been an amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, and just based I on the Yeah, I, I can't even tell you how much I learned. It was, I, I was literally thinking, oh my God, I, I, didn't, I didn't do myself justice. I have to go and fill out more applications and do more things yeah right. i'll tell you opened a window during your presentation and are applying on the side for their loans yeah i will definitely um email you guys a couple of the resources that we talked about the new irs website with the stimulus payment uh, aicpa state by state i saw a lot of questions about this state or that state i know that's a big one for investors and syndicators who was the third one you wrote down um, um, improvements by the tenant for the commercial lease. Okay, commercial lease. Yeah, so some of these uh, questions that we, we didn't know the answers to, we'll send that to you as well. Uh, but yeah, it's funny because I did a, I know, um, Jillian, you have a happy hour every day. So my girlfriends and I, we, we did a Zoom happy hour just yeah. like with four people. And uh, our initial plan was to, you know, drink and chit chat. And I started talking about these loans. 10 minutes later, everybody was like, you know, looking at loans, applying for loans. It ended up not being a very fun happy hour for me. <laughs> because I just kind of sat there and watched them apply for loans. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's so great. Oh my goodness. No, our happy hour is a little more fun than that. But <laughs> if you want to invite Amanda to your happy hour tonight, her I promise I won't talk about taxes. Every no, everyone is welcome. <laughs> Um, I'll put a, I'll put a link out on my, um, personal Facebook page. Everybody's welcome. Sorry. Are you able, are you able to convince, um, we, talk, uh, but we try to be more fun. We play games on there and stuff like that. It's just to really, do you get Jean to join you on those things? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Not his crowd. So, um, but, uh, you know, I will, I, I will say this. Um, what we'll do, what Nancy and I are going to do is we're going to compile all of the questions that you guys didn't get answered. Um, and we're going to figure out another time we can do a Facebook live or another zoom call. And we'll try to get those, those compiled, consolidated, streamlined and get those answered for you. Um, and Amanda and Matt, if you could obviously help us with that, because we're not experts in this, that would be super awesome. No, totally. Yeah. Totally. Because I, I, we want to do that because you know, the more questions we get, the more we learn about this too. And so, um, so yeah, thank you for sending all the questions. They're just. Matt and Amanda, I've had a few people asking if they want to contact you directly. Can you just let them know again, the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't come, don't come to our house. <laughs> Well, Nancy, I'm actually putting on, um, on our crowdfunding lawyers website in about five minutes, there'll be a live post that has, um, their contact information. And it ha also has several links that they, um, they've already prepared on their website as well. So please share the information, but just know that there'll be a, a, a live page on our website in just a few minutes that has a bunch of information, um, okay. Amanda. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. I think so. Yeah, for our website, it's www.keystonecpa.com. Uh, lots of free resources there. You can sign up for a newsletter. Um, for email, uh, info at keystonecpa.com is the best. And like Lauren said, we, we put together uh, three summaries, one for the loans, one for just kind of general tax changes on retirement and depreciation and losses. And the third one what was the third one I can't remember. Uh, oh, um, that the third one is mostly for business, business owners, owners on, on how to get, how to get a credit, credit for, for paying your employees. Um, so Lauren has the live links. I highly recommend when, when you're looking at those, try to click on the links each time because things are changing every day and we're updating um, the PDF every day. So don't, you know, if you save it onto your computer, you visit it two, two weeks later, that already might be outdated information. So always use that link to get the latest info. Okay. okay and that, um, that page is actually live now on our website. So if you go to crowdfundinglawyers.net and go under post or blog, it, it, they'll, you'll be able to see that. It's titled CARES Act Update for Syndicators. So you can find all that information. And like Amanda said, all those links that are provided there will be updated as they, as they update information. So make sure you're checking back for the most current information. And you, and you have the link on there for Jillian's happy hour too? Uh, no, I don't have that, but I'm, I'm sure they can, they can find us somewhere for sure. Um, but all the stuff that you've presented today, <laughs> and we will be sure to get, we'll get that up. We have so many questions. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Thanks so much, you guys, for your time. I appreciate all that helpful information. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Guys. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>